The early regional findings for the 2017 total eclipse of the sun across North America starting now. Welcome to Ham Radio 2.0, folks. My name's Jason. I'm KC5HWB. If this is your first time here to join us, please click on the subscribe button below. Click on the bell notification icon so that you can stay up to date with all the episodes we post on this channel, which has everything and anything to do with what is new in amateur radio. Today I get to present to you uh, this topic that was given at the Tapper Digital Communications Conference in Albuquerque of 2018. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, the, the two guys, um, Phil and Nathaniel, who present on this topic, on this particular session, are from the Han Sai, Ham Sai, H-A-M, Sierra, Charlie, India, <laughs> Ham Sai, group. And uh, we're going to be doing some uh, new stuff upcoming with them on this channel later on, probably early part of next year. So check out this talk, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so we have a little tag team here. Phil's going to go first and then Nathaniel. And their talk is on the ionospheric measurements of the 2017 Great American Eclipse. So Phil Erickson, W1PJE. Thanks a lot. And uh, like, uh, like Steve mentioned, we're going to share this talk. So I'm going to spend the first part of this talk uh, kind of just going over a few basics uh, that will help you appreciate the eclipse that we had last year. How many people actually tried to see it in this room? Yeah, wow, okay. You guys are very dedicated and as I would have expected. Um, so I'm gonna spend the first half setting up a bit of the, the solar physics which, uh, and solar and ionospheric physics that go into why eclipses are special. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the sort of professional ionospheric research that's already come out about the eclipse. But the important thing is that will then set up Nathaniel to talk about amateur radio-based eclipse research, which he is uh, responsible for uh, spearheading from this past eclipse. So those of you, obviously so many people in this room, um, you know, tried to watch the eclipse. This was, NASA had a lot of um, press releases and a very nice website where people could log in and find out more about the eclipse. By the way, some of you will notice down here the, the goals of science. Safety, you know, don't look at the, the sun with your remaining good eye. And then, um, and public engagement, okay? This was a really large opportunity for a lot of the people uh, out there to do a little bit of astronomy and learn about uh, an, an enormous event, which in this case went straight across the uh, North American continent, as we're going to see. So um, I have to acknowledge a lot of support from uh, NASA and National Science Foundation. The NASA Heliophysics Division supported a good amount of this research. And my colleagues at MIT Haystack, um, and you'll hear a little bit more about Haystack when I, I give the uh, talk after, uh, at dessert la uh, tomorrow evening, and an enormous number of research community people. So this is a map of all the eclipses that are over the continental US. And this goes back from 1950, and it goes a century forward. So uh, those of us who will be around in 2052, uh, you can find the, the purple dots on this map. So if you live in Florida and you're here in 2052, you can stand right there at the Alabama border and go see it. Um, the, the eclipse that just happened in 2017 are these orange triangles that went right through here. This was a really spectacular opportunity because now it turns out that the continental US is instrumented with a bunch of research grade networks that were not available in 1954 or 1959 or even through 1979. So this was a really, uh, the, 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 the community of course knew about this eclipse many, many years before. A fellow named Fred Espinak at NASA actually has a table of all the eclipses occurring everywhere. And by the way, there's at least one partial eclipse every year somewhere on the planet that goes over land. You can look at Fred's table. This one, though, because of its coverage, was particularly spectacular, so uh, there was a lot of gearing up in preparation for this eclipse. Um, this was another map, this is from Ernie Wright at NASA Goddard, showing you the path of the totality track. And my point to this audience is that a lot of the media coverage concentrated on the totality track. It turns out that the penumbra, the partial shadow, is equally as important in looking at eclipse effects, in this case on the upper atmosphere, or the ionosphere, which is the propagation medium that everyone in this room enjoys using. 
This is the 90% obscuration line. This is the 75%. Down into Mexico, the eclipse was actually 50% obscured of the sun during this particular period of time and way up into Canada. So essentially, the entire continental US was involved to some extent. So it wasn't the case that there was this tiny, tiny little strip of effect that only occurred in this totality. And as you'll see, the upper atmospheric data and the observations that Nathaniel is going to show a little bit later really bear that out. Why? Well, you have to think about what the ionosphere is doing. And again, pardon me if this is, this is review for maybe many of you, but why do we have an ionosphere in the first place? Well, we have an upper atmosphere, okay? Uh, the neutral part of the atmosphere. It's what we're breathing as we're talking here. And that gradually falls off with altitude uh, and gets progressively lighter. But there's a good amount of atmosphere available at altitudes out to several hundred kilometers. And in fact, if you keep on going, it goes pretty far out. There's a geocorona that goes out to several Earth radii that's made of neutral hydrogen. All of that is food for being ionized by the extreme ultraviolet portion of the nearest star that we live next to, a medium-sized um, uh, star. And the extreme ultraviolet part of that star is not as intense in terms of, of flux as the radiation that we see out uh, for, which is, which is when I, I give tours to people, I mention that that's the reason why when you grow up and you're five years old, you don't wander out and say, Mom, it's solar minimum, I can't see anything. You don't necessarily know that there's a solar cycle because there's only about a 0.1% variation in the optical between solar minimum and solar maximum. If you go out to the extreme ultraviolet, though, those little photons have a lot of energy, and they have enough energy to start breaking apart neutrals, leaving behind electrons and ions. And so this is created daily every time the sun comes up by the fact that the sunlit part of the planet is flooded with extreme ultraviolet, and even though, it, and it's highly variable, by, by the way, which is another reason why it's an interesting subject and why your radio doesn't work exactly the same every time you turn it on. Um, and there, it's, again, a plasma, which is a charge, fourth, the fourth state of matter, 99% of the universe is plasma. So it's composed of electrons and ions, almost all positive. I won't talk about the negative ones. There are some down in the D region. So the neutral people have stratified the atmosphere either by temperature or by composition in the troposphere where we're talking goes out to the stratosphere, to the mesosphere, and then something called the thermosphere. Well, this is the base level neutral atmosphere that's co-rotating along with our planet. And again, if you hit it with ultra extreme ultraviolet, you create the ionosphere. And very familiar to this audience, you create layers like the F layer, the E layer, the D layer, that are, uh, that are occurring, that it's a, it's a function of the fact that the radiation intensity in extreme ultraviolet is falling off as those photons penetrate lower and lower altitudes, because of course some of them are being absorbed, causing photoionization. And but the neutral density, the number of particles available to be ionized, is going up. So those two curves cross one another, and you end up with a profile like this that has layers between, you know, for the F layer between 200 and 400 or 500 kilometers, depending. And then the E layer is pretty thin between 100 kilometers. There's another, there are other ionospheric physics here, but suffice it to say that for purposes of HF propagation, this electron density structure is highly refractive at HF frequencies, which is one of the reasons why we have over the horizon propagation on long propagation paths. And from day to night, it changes quite a bit. To zero order, we shut the sun off at night. So in fact, the E region disappears very quickly because it recombines within an hour. The F region is slower, hangs around for a good portion of the evening, and it also then gets transported around because somewhere on the planet, it's sunlit. So even if it's midnight here, it's sunlit over in Siberia, and that plasma actually moves around horizontally in a really complicated picture. So if I start modulating the sun's output in extreme ultraviolet by, for example, throwing the moon in front of it, I should expect a response. And that's why an eclipse is such an interesting scientific experiment. Uh, this is a very famous guy in our field. This is the late Henry Rishbeth, who is, uh, uh, was at the University of Southampton in UK. And he wrote a very nice paper way back in 1968, pointing out that simple differential equation, the number of production of charges 
from electrons or ions is a function of essentially the normal production function, and that's just the extreme ultraviolet coming in. And then here's the loss processes, which, as you notice, are different in the E layer and the F layer. Um, that's one of the reasons why they have kind of different dynamics. During the eclipse, you can put a function on that, which is basically the obscuration function. So this is me sticking my moon in front of the sun. It's going to go over, cover, and then come back. And what Henry pointed out in 1968 is very true today, is that solar eclipses are very special because you can study both this production function, because you're covering up enti the entire sunlit disk, or a part of it, and the Earth's ionosphere itself. It is the ultimate in an active experiment, and it happens for free, just by orbital dynamics. So people, since there have been measuring tools way back to when ionosons first came into the picture in the 1920s, have been looking at eclipses. Um, that's because the ionosphere is naturally complex. This is, a, this is a particular product that we produce at Haystack Observatory. This is derived, as I'll talk about before, from the GPS navigation signals cluster. This is a map of the total number of electrons in a vertical column underneath each pixel. And I'll show you that, well, that's a 24-hour day in the life of the ionosphere. Anything but simple. You can follow where the more noontime is, or early afternoon, there it is. But you can see that there's variations with latitude, with longitude, and um, each day is different from the previous day. This is space weather. This is where the field is right now. We're beginning to get a handle on the climatology, but now we have to look at the variations from climatology. So we're kind of at the stage where we can tell you maybe what the average high and low temperature is today, but we can't tell you too much at all about whether it's going to rain or snow. At least we're very poor at it. So this is naturally occurring space weather. The eclipse is a gigantic kick in the pants for the ionosphere, which provides us a predictable time where we know that we're going to modulate this. This is a radar that I happen to operate in eastern Massachusetts, and I'll describe a little bit more of that tomorrow evening. But treat this as an altitude profile now of the electron density in the ionosphere. This is a log scale, number of electrons in a cube, a meter on a side. This is midnight now, where you have to switch to your mind to universal time. There's sunrise. Here's the, here's the F region in this particular mode. There's some E region down here. There's sunset. The E region goes away, and the F region modulates. So there's a lot of variation in altitude as well. So this is a four-dimensional system, three dimensions times time. And it's a very complicated physical picture, so we'd like as many experiments as we can get to see if we can pick out the details of why things behave the way they do. This was some advanced predictions of what the, the, what the eclipse should be doing to the actual upper atmosphere. This is a prediction of the change in the number of total electrons in a column on a particular scale. OK, that's not a little strip, is it? That's covering the entire continent. And notice that there's a response in the other hemisphere. This is what we expected to see just from a first principles model, which is a bit open range and unhinged. We didn't really know if this was right. But the point is that because the ionosphere is electrically charged and we have a magnetic field line that goes from here to there, both hemispheres have to be affected. So this is actually a global effect, even though the stripe is going this way. There have been a lot of previous e eclipse research examples. This is a paper, if you can't read it, from 1939. This is Hurlbert from the Naval Research Lab in Washington using ionosons. And there's him measuring what he expects the E region ionization to do as the shadow happens. And it temporarily turns to night and then turns back to day. People found electron density reductions. They found waves being launched. They found a lot of significant cooling. The atmosphere got cold. But these are very few and limited observations, little point measurements here and there. We should be able to do better using modern tools and observations. And that's what we tried to do. So what was new for this eclipse? Well, we have a suite of things like low Earth orbiting satellites that can look at the neutral atmosphere, ground-based large uh, aperture high power ionospheric radars that can look at those altitude profiles, and Nathaniel's going to talk about distributed networks that are measuring things over wider regions. Tools I've mentioned already, these radars, this is the NASA Time satellite, which is basically looking at, for example, the concentration of neutral oxygen and uh, uh, atomic molecular nitrogen and its ratio. And then I mentioned GNSSS receivers. The same thing that you guys use to navigate somewhere has an ionospheric model buried in it. The ionosphere delays those signals. You have to take that out in order to solve the navigation equ uh, equation uh, 
correctly, if you save that information, you can actually pull out ionospheric thickness from it. And that happens over wide areas. This is, a, this is one of the ionospheric radars, happens to be the one I run again. This is something called incoherent or Thomson scatter. You're putting off a wave that's actually at UHF frequencies. It's at, my, my transmitter frequency is 440.2 megahertz. Um, but I'm actually sending a signal right out into free space and I'm actually moving the electrons and they're becoming little Hertzian dipoles and they're radiating a, basically a signal at the thermal noise level. If you collect that and average it in just the right way, you can actually use that as a remote sensing tool. And I have a very wide field of view over most of the eastern coast of the U.S. Um, and yes, that's not a typo. Um, I send a megawatt up and I get 10 femtowatts back. In the 1950s, receivers were quiet enough that you could make this measurement. So um, this was available to look at detailed linospheric structure. I mentioned timed, which is basically looking at an atmospheric emission at a certain wavelength and looking at the ratio of O to N2. Why do we care about O to N2? O is the thing that makes most of the electrons in the F region. O gets broken apart into O plus and E minus. N2 eats electrons. N2 tends to suck up electrons and go back to a neutral state. So N2 pluses take, take in electrons and go back. This ratio is a, is a sensitive indicator of where you're going to be producing more or less electron density. So the blue areas are the places where that ratio is low and we have a weaker ionospheric source. The red areas are stronger. So this was actually up there measuring those kinds of things to set our background ionization potential as this eclipse went by. I mentioned that. There's one of those little new leagues again. The processing can extract a global ionospheric map. We also can study the D region. D region, I mentioned D region, and you all should kind of cringe, right, and, and walk back, because the D region events are not things that you like, because they absorb pretty much everything in the HF spectrum. Um, they're typically, the D region is activated during the day, which is another reason why lower propagation bands don't work because there's lots of attenuation. The D region actually, we don't know that much about some of the time constants, so we're not exactly sure how fast the D region goes away if you don't turn the sun off gradually over a couple of hours as occurs during a normal thing, but instead you turn it off really fast and really back. So my colleague Bob Marshall of the University of Colorado was actually doing D region responses by doing things about me measuring actually on VLF links down at 20 something kilohertz from the US Navy transmitter systems and using that to probe the D region. And you get fun little propagation paths that look like that one. So we could even take a look at the D region, which is where the ionosphere is highly collisional. The, basically, there's so little ions that they're getting bashed around by the neutrals pretty much before they have a chance to move anywhere. And I mentioned this. Um, this, by the way, is that same sort of ionospheric total electron content map if you subtract off the background. Those are waves. And there's a whole natural set of waves that are there every day if you look. And we wanted to see what the waves did when we, when we again, move the eclipse shadow. And I have to thank the, ge the worldwide geolo geology community because they decided to put all of their data online in a common format. And we can then take it and make a map like this and I don't have to pay for all of the six to 8,000 receivers that I'm using right now. So thank you to geologists. It pays to have a common data format that you think about beforehand. So this is the big picture, okay? And so uh, briefly, before I turn it over to Nathaniel, what happened? What did we see? Well, this was some modeling that was occurred after the eclipse happened and people got to look at a little bit of the data. This was the global signature of holes in the total electron density after the eclipse had passed. In fact, this was several hours after the eclipse had passed. The eclipse launched a large wave that basically went that way, went through the southern hemisphere and kept going. Um, this was a signature in the electron density in the ionosphere. This is the signature in the neutral atmospheric temperature. This is the signature in the neutral upper atmospheric winds. This is the signature in the ionospheric velocities. Everything was affected by the eclipse to some extent. So this was indeed an active experiment. I'm an observationalist. All of you guys are observationalists. This is a model, okay? So I tend to try to have the observations lead the models. So how does this link up to what we saw? This is a set of scans that we did with this electron uh, uh, incoherent scatter radar in, in eastern Massachusetts. This was a scan of the ionospheric structure from where we were looking to the west and south. 
before the eclipse came along, and here it is during the eclipse, and you notice that not only are is there yellow here where there was red, but there was also a giant hole in this direction. That's because the eclipse shadow was right here. So once again, widespread effects on the ionosphere, and you'll find out by extension on HF propagation. Drop of a factor of two over a, less than an hour. This was the ionospheric signature straight vertical over eastern Massachusetts, a thousand kilometers away from that totality shadow. Can you find the eclipse? There it is. It basically took out most of the F region. And then when the, sh when the, when the penumbral shadow went by and the eclipse went, came back, funny things started happening. All of a sudden, the, the layer height went up, and then we got a brightening. All of this plasma suddenly started raining down from above us, and we're still trying to figure out why. Um, the other interesting thing about what we found is this, by the way, was our model for a typical day. This was a reference day that was not the eclipse. And here is the eclipse. You'll see some variations in this. There was a lot of space weather that was occurring even on the non-eclipse day. So it's complicated. There was natural weather, and then there was the weather created by the eclipse, and we're trying to untangle them. And this was really interesting. Since 1970, there had been a prediction that of something based on a curious feature, which is that eclipse shadow is moving supersonically. So the local time under the eclipse is not the same from when it entered the United States in the Washington state area to when it exited in South Carolina. When it entered the United States, it was about 11 a.m. local time, and when it exited, it was about 2.30. So the eclipse shadow was moving supersonically. Any sailors here? You know about bow waves? You run your boat faster than the local s speed of the water, and you get these ripples that go out. And if you look, they actually form V structures. So back in 1970, people, people predicted, well, as the wave fronts pile up here and get stretched out, we should see something. And we actually found it. This is differential TEC. So this is, again, just um, the difference from climatology. This is the first time we've actually measured this unambiguously because the eclipse track went straight down the pipeline across the United States. It left behind waves that subsequently propagated at the local sound speed. Now, that's a static figure, and for those of you who like geophysical research letters articles, there's an article about it. Sometimes I like movies. Here you go. Okay, there's the normal state. This is local noon. And at some point, there comes the eclipse. I don't think you're going to notice. It's not hard to figure out. There it is. Now watch. Right in here. Boom. V-shaped structures. Right there. So we finally confirmed something that essentially, you know, modeling people who do fluid dynamics have predicted for a very long time. And it's because we had a whole ton of distributed measurements. And that'll again set up what Nathaniel's going to talk about a little bit. So this is going to run one more time because it's worth seeing. So if you have a sensitive enough instrument, you can actually detect these kind of ripples. Um, you know, pretty much you can watch them being circular, and then if you look and take frames, you can watch them going into V-structures. So that's pretty cool. So, before I turn it over to Nathaniel here, just a summary that, as you can tell, eclipses are, are definitely a rich, rich source of information about the dynamic atmosphere. Each one's different, because each one has a different path, a different obscuration function, and you have different conditions before the eclipse comes along. Okay, it's slightly different local time, slightly different season. So every one of them tells us something different about the basic and applied physics, I'm not going to arrange for the sun to turn off and on in an hour's time by myself. Fortunately, uh, the universe does that for us. And non-traditional observation networks have a lot to contribute to this. You just saw that in the GPS cluster. That was not designed to do that measurement, but people bootstrapped it. And so that's where I'm going to turn it over to Nathaniel. If anybody has any questions on this part while we're turning over, please feel free to ask me. Um, George, there's somebody over there while I switch. Oh, you do. Go ahead. I'm a little unclear about why the bow wave developed so far through the, the cycle over the U.S. Why wasn't there a bow wave when it came on 
right. to the West Coast. Yes, exactly. Why didn't it immediately appear just as soon as it entered? The thinking now seems to be that you had to get to a certain local time because the electron density is actually increasing from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. So when we hit the critical amount of electron density, then the waves got triggered. Some other people are also trying to figure out whether it's connected to lower atmosphere waves that were being generated because the ground was cool. And so you cooled the lower atmosphere, and that's actually propagating up and perhaps interfering with and amplifying these waves. But right now, we're trying to get the modelers to even just start trying to model this. That's why I said the observations are way ahead of the modeling. But it's just, it was totally mind-blowing when my colleague Chen Rong showed me this movie. We stood there for like two hours and just went over and over because we couldn't believe that we were actually seeing it. Other things? Great. So, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Phil. I really appreciate that. Um, so, my name is Nathaniel, my call sign is W2NAF, and I'm a research professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And um, I also uh, started and coordinate the Ham Radio Sciences Investigation, which is this collective to work to interface the professional um, radio, atmospheric, space physics research community with the amateur uh, community. And I'm, I'm a part of both, so it's, it's a really neat thing. Um, I'd also like to again thank uh, the National Science Foundation uh, and NJIT for their support in this project and all of the people who've helped along the way. I've had uh, many of you help. I actually have a whole list of people to thank at the end of this. Um, but I'm not going to go through all of the basics of eclipses and ionospheres since Phil covered a lot of that already, but I wanted to highlight a couple um, interesting things or one interesting thing. This is a movie I made up. And it just shows, uh, it calculates the obscuration amount, the percent of obscuration um, as a, in grid squares going across the United States. And it looks very similar to a lot of the movies you've seen before. But the difference is this one's actually calculated at 300 kilometers altitude. So you actually get a different obscuration function at 300 kilometers altitude versus the ground. And you might ask, how different? And that's actually what this movie does. So here, I calculated it at 300 kilometers altitude and at the ground, and I subtracted the two. And so wherever you see blues, it's more eclipsed at altitude. That's a positive value up to um, 0.1, um, I guess about 1% more eclipsed at altitude. And it goes down to red, which is more eclipsed on the ground. So you can just get a feel of what the geometry of that looks like. So you can see, see what a difference that really makes. Um, now the software to calculate this, it's uh, it written in Python and you can go onto our GitHub page. So if you want to play around with calculating the, uh, the Eclipse uh, values yourself, you can go do that, which may be useful later because there's still a lot more data to be analyzed. So for HamSci, uh, we coordinated three different experiments, and I'm going to talk about two of them today. Uh, one is the HF frequency measurement experiment, and this really engaged people from the frequency measurement test community. Now, how many people here consider themselves part of the FMT community? We've got, yeah, we've got quite a few here, yeah. And this, this is probably the right audience for that. So I'll talk a little bit about that. We, we had some of you monitor uh, say WWV or CHU for uh, frequency changes as the eclipse happened. And then the one that I, I was really behind this one was the Solar Eclipse QSO party, where I really wanted to see um, could we take a contest-like event and get something, get useful science information out of this from this quasi-random data set. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And um, the third thing was the HF wideband recording, which I won't talk about so much, um, but you've, you've heard about before. Uh, John Ackerman's presented on that. Um, so this is where we made uh, large-scale recordings. Now, last year I presented a, on Eclipse results, but that was very shortly, um, only about a month or so after the actual Eclipse happened. So we didn't have much time to actually crunch numbers last year, but this year we've actually gotten so far that we've gotten some published papers out of the results, so this really updates that. Now, uh, for the next slide, I just wanted to uh, take a moment. Uh, something very sad happened. 
Um, and that was uh, Steve Ryer, WA9. Uh, I think there should be an N in there, VNJ. Um, he passed away uh, earlier this year. And um, that was uh, very unfortunate because um, he was really, I think, a key part of the uh, FMT community. I didn't know him well. I met him as a part of this eclipse. I found out he was a, an emeritus uh, professor of electrical engineering at the Milwaukee School of Engineering, and he taught uh, digital signal processing, communications, microprocessors, circuits, and senior design, in the act, and he was active in the FMT community. And um, he was really very important for the frequency measurement experiment because he really helped me to write the guidelines that we posted to the HAMSI website telling people what we want them to do for the frequency measurement test for this experiment. And um, so he helped me write this and he helped write out procedures for how you use Spectrum Lab to make recordings of this and, and save this data, post it to Zenodo in such a way that it could be used in the future. And then not in addition to helping me with all of that, he left us a really beautiful data set of observations during the eclipse. And so that's what I'm going to show now. Now um, this is uh, from, an, uh, from results that he sent me. So he was located uh, here near Milwaukee and WWV is over here and he monitored uh, 10 megahertz WWV throughout the eclipse and also he did a control day the day before and his instrumentation he used the Yezu FT 857 uh, connected it was driven by a Trimble Thunderbolt GPS uh, disciplined oscillator and it was interfaced with an XREF FT oscillator interface and um, he used uh, a Rigel a uh, signal generator locked to a second Thunderbolt for reference signals. I used a DX Engineering RF Pro 1B aimed north south for the antenna and um, used a Spectrum Lab and some custom DSP software to do the processing. And he sent me two sets of data and this is actually the figure that he sent. This is not from Eclipse Day but the day before. So this was his control day and right here this is 10 megahertz and then you can see in the morning you have these positive frequency shifts where it goes up 0.2 hertz and then um, it kind of settles down and then at the end of the day it goes down about 0.2 hertz as well almost. And so these are Doppler shifts that I believe you see as the ionosphere is developing during the day and signal paths are getting a little shorter in the morning and then in the evening as the ionosphere lets up you have those path lengths get longer and you get a, a negative Doppler shift. Um, along the way here we also get this big spike and you might wonder what that is. Well if you look at the GOES x-ray data, x-ray flux data, you can see a uh, C5 class solar flare occurred right at that time. And so you have, you have this really nice evidence of sudden ionization uh, penetrating into the lower ionosphere is causing that sudden spike in the Doppler shift. Now on the eclipse day this is what he sent me and you again see the morning um, positive Doppler shift and the evening negative Doppler shift and then you can see where uh, I believe he marked these times off as the midway point between uh, his station and uh, WWV you can actually see the opposite effect. So when the eclipse is coming on, that's kind of like evening, you see this negative Doppler shift here. Uh, during, after the eclipse as it's leaving, you see positive Doppler shifts. And then things kind of return to normal. Um, so that's like those, a really large scale effect that I think is very clearly connected with the eclipse. A couple curious things. Um, one thing that's very curious is there's a lot of variability in here. It's not just like, um, it just doesn't go up positive Doppler shift and then, you know, come back down. There's a lot of, a lot of hash and we don't really understand that. So that's something that we still need to figure out why that occurs. And the other thing that, this is what really uh, got my curiosity where I spent some time working on this, was I saw this little twist right here. And it happened right at maximum, right? And so I'm like, well that's cool. And that first, uh, thought you're like, well, of course it's due to the eclipse, right? And, but then you have to say, well, if you think about the way the Doppler shifts normally work, I mean, it should be going negative Doppler shifts as the eclipse is starting and positive as the eclipse is ending. And this is the opposite. It's on a very short time scale. 
So we have to ask, is this S-curve real? And it's also a very small, like 0 0.05 uh, hertz deviations here. So you can see how sensitive this is. So I, I did some simulations and I checked um, some other data sources. And I'm sad to report that that little curve is not part of the eclipse. <laughs> but <laughs> it still is interesting because what it was is actually another small solar flare. There was a small solar flare right at that time that lined up right with our eclipse observations. And, and his observations were sensitive enough to pick that up, which is fantastic. So uh, right down here, this is the X-ray flare data. And so you can see a little bump right there. So this is only about a, a C2 class flare. This is not a big solar flare. It doesn't usually cause a lot of a problem, but it was enough to create that small Doppler shift in his 10 megahertz observations. And here, that's, the red is his measurement up here, little S-curve that you saw. Now up here, the blue, this is actually um, a ray trace uh, simulation that I did using the same um, data or the same model outputs that Phil showed you before, that prediction of what the ionosphere would look like. Uh, it's, that was predicted using a physics code called SAMI3. And so here, this predicts um, at this frequency, 10 megahertz, what the reflection height would be. So you can see that the reflection height goes up and then it comes back down. And so this is actually E region, so it starts at 110 kilometers and goes up to about 125 kilometers here and then comes back down. And then the blue line down here, this is the modeled uh, Doppler shift for that. And so here you can see more of what you expect with the negative Doppler shifts as it's rising, as the reflection height is rising, and the more positive Doppler shifts as the reflection height is lowering. So that kind of, that does, you know, firm up a little bit of those larger scale shifts that we saw before. But it was really interesting to see this. Now, as I said, we still need to figure out a bunch of this hash and stuff. Um, so we, this data that he recorded is available on um, is available on Zenodo, so you can go to this website and you can actually download his data and you can investigate this yourself. And he documented all that he did to uh, make this recording. And that's really important. It's really important to document how the data was recorded so we can use it in the future. So I need to move a little bit along here. And um, for the solar eclipse QSO party thing, uh, part of the experiment, I wanted to know, you know, can we use HF ham radio communications to observe eclipse effects on the ionosphere? Can we use data model comparisons to better understand ham radio data? And to, can we constrain or calibrate a model? And the model we're going to use is that SAMI3 using the same ray tracing techniques I explained before. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to know this is right now we have systems like Reverse Beacon Network, WhisperNet, they're just crunching all of this data or collecting all this data. Can we actually use it for something? And so if we create a, um, a, a way of looking at that data systematically, maybe during the eclipse, maybe we can also use those other techniques to study other periods. So here I'm just uh, talking, reminding us about the hand bands. They each are refract off of the ionosphere, but a little bit differently. So if the ionosphere is, say, weaker, these higher frequencies, 14 through 30 megahertz, they might penetrate through. If it's stronger, like during the day or when there's not an eclipse, those might get refracted back. Um, reverse beacon network, for people who are not aware, we have an automated CW skimmer uh, program which can automatically decode who's on the band and that information gets sent back in real time to this website and they archive all of that data so you can download it for later use. So the Solar Eclipse QSO party uh, essentially was an eight hour contest and that was to motivate a lot of people to get on the air, to have fun. Um, I liked contests. We tried to organize the points in such a way to uh, maximize the number of observations a reverse speaking network would make, a uh, WhisperNet PSK reporter would make. And we also had people submit logs to here. Uh, we had very good participation, over 570 uh, parsed logs, almost 30,000 QSOs, um, almost 5,000 unique call signs. So it was really good. And the 
observational uh, systems, RBN gave us over 600,000 spots. Same thing with the WhisperNet PSK reporter, uh, over 1.2 million spots. So a lot of data to work with. I think I showed this movie last year. I can't quite remember, but I've shown it a number of times. This is all of the data. So I hope you remembered all those numbers I just showed you, and now you can count the dots and make sure I got it right. OK? So, but, but good. OK, so you agree with me? But did you, it's really hard to see the eclipse effects in this. And you, know, you can squint, and you can definitely see some things, especially in this panel. But we really had to organize the data in a different way in order to really see the, the effects. Now, here we're showing all the reverse speaking network dots, and all this is showing color-coded is how much obscuration there was. So you can see where uh, totality went straight across the US. The blue stars are all the RBN receivers, and the little black dots are the transmitters. And so if you were um, a CW station during the SEQP, you should be able to find your dot on here. So that should be there. Um, Again, to make it more tractable, we just focused on the region of greater than 90% eclipse. So I, I trimmed out a lot of data there. And then I plotted the data like this. I organized everything in terms of epoch hours. So epoch zero means it was maximum eclipse at that particular point. Um, and this plot goes back one and a half hours and plus one and a half hours. So, and then this curve here is uh, eclipse, the eclipse function from the middle of the United States. And this particular one's for 14 megahertz and it goes from zero to 3,000 kilometers. And then the colors here are density number of spots for that particular coordinate. So you can see at the beginning of the figure, we had a lot of communications before the eclipse happened on 14 megahertz CW between 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers in path length. As the eclipse happened and the electron density goes down, um, 14 meters essentially, I'm sorry, 14 megahertz, 20 meters, essentially shuts down for more or less the date, duration of the eclipse, and then it starts to come back. And that's what we'd expect, you know, it's similar, similar to evening. Now, I made a plot like this for uh, all of the bands we had good data for, which was uh, 14 megahertz, 7 megahertz, 3.5 megahertz, and 1.8 megahertz. And we already talked, all of these have the same coordinate axes, although the color bars are different. But you can see with 7 megahertz, um, as the ionosphere gets weaker and you go into night, you might expect the band to go longer in terms of path length. That's exactly what you see here. And then on 3.5 and, and uh, 1.8 megahertz, you see the band open up as the D region disappears. And this effect is long happens for a longer period of time on 40 meters than it does on 160 meters. Here I'm talking about the same SAMI 3 model that Phil introduced before. And this is a movie that shows the ray tracing through the SAMI 3 model uh, from Florida to Wisconsin. The top is no eclipse and the bottom is the eclipse. So you can see and the red is when we predict that there should be a contact between the two stations. Uh, WE9B was one of our best RBN receivers. I'll play this once again. So yeah, really focused down here, you see you have the connection, strong ionosphere, then as the eclipse comes in, the ionosphere gets weaker, the, we predict the connection goes away. And this is for 14.03 megahertz, and then it comes back. Now, um, you may remember my student Josh Vega, WP2JSV, he was here last year. Uh, he's a computer science student, he's getting ready to graduate, which is why he's not here right now. But he was instrumental in getting that uh, ray tracing code on our NJIT supercomputer so that he did ray traces for all four of those bands uh, in three minute time steps for six hours of the SCQP between every one of these little black dots are theoretical gridded transmitters to every one of these blue stars. That's a lot of, a lot of data points. It took almost a week to run on our uh, cluster. And, but then we were able to put that, those results on the right-hand side in a format that we could compare to the observations on left-hand side. And here I've selected only the modeling results with refract refraction at heights of less than 125 kilometers altitude. And you can see the 14 megahertz model matches really nicely. So, but the others, the lower bands do not. What this is telling me is that uh, the 14 megahertz um, model 
is mostly refracting off of the E region. The um, other bands, they actually match better with the uh, refracting off of the F region. And so you can see that there's much better agreement there. Uh, the reason this doesn't agree, and this doesn't agree up here, is actually because I believe the model background electron density is set too high. So if we were to rerun this, we might have to say, okay, let's uh, tone down the electron density a bit, and then I think we'll have better agreement here. So, in conclusion, the SCQP generated over two and a half million data points, and I've only looked at the RBN ones. Uh, we've seen eclipse effects on all of the on all of these bands, um, it lasted 0.3 hours plus or minus on 1.8 megahertz, 0.75 hours on 3.5 and, and 7 megahertz, and uh, plus one hours plus or minus one hours on 14 megahertz. And um, in the ray tracing suggested that uh, the 14 megahertz bands they refracted off of the E region, the 160 meter through um, 40 meter bands refracted off of the F region. Uh, I also found out that they used um, higher takeoff angles, where the 14 megahertz ones used lower takeoff angles, and the background SAMI density, SAMI 3 density is slightly too high. Um, I should note that having this ability to compare to a real scientific model is extremely important, especially if you want to try and show something in the scientific community. And by doing that, uh, by comparing it with a real research model, we were able to get this published in geophysical research letters. So you can go read about those observations there. Now finally, this was basically a ham radio contest. So these are the um, uh, results of this top single operators, the top multi operators, and I also had a uh, SCQP uh, 10,000 plus club. Uh, so they got 10,000 or more uh, spots throughout the uh, solar eclipse QSO party and all of this was very important for us to be able to make our observations. So again, special thank you to all of the operators and all of our researchers who've helped out with this and I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>